So he's not um, retired. He's no, not he's not retired. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, before we get started with um, our retiree recognition, we'd like to recognize Dr. Michael Keller, who's here with his family. If you want to come on up. So Michael's been hired as our uh, Director of Social Emotional Support, and we're very glad to have him on board, and we're glad he could come, and um, we'll let him introduce his family and say a few words. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Board President Vickers, and esteemed members of the board, and uh, Superintendent Valoria, Executive Cabinet, community members, principals, administrators, teachers, retirees. Uh, so happy to be here. My name is Michael Keller. <laughs> Uh, I'm your new director of social and emotional support starting in July. I'm absolutely thrilled to have this opportunity. I've committed my career to developing systems around supporting students' social emotional needs. I've been a school counselor, been a school psychologist, a special education leader, most recently in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And the common thread throughout all of that has been supporting the social emotional well being of all students. So. Really excited about this great opportunity. I'm excited to be working with such a visionary board and a great, great team of passionate educators. And I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce my family. This is my wife, Allison. She's a school psychologist in Long Beach Unified School District. Allison. <laughs> this, this is my son, Owen. He's a fourth grader. And this is my daughter, Ainsley. For your support, Dr. Keller will be an amazing asset to our district and a phenomenal addition to our department. We're really pleased. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our district. It's been a problem. We have received a lot of input that this is an area we need to increase our attention to uh, to provide for our students. And so we really are pleased to be that we're able to do this and able to add this. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're on the street as you're a rock star, so no pressure. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I neglected to introduce my mother-in-law, Anne Golay. She's a marriage family therapist, an amazing, uh, she's got a mentor in my life, so. <laughs> <laughs> our staff who have retired or will be retiring at the end of this school year. We're privileged to recognize these dedicated members of our LBUSD family who have served us for so many years. These are staff members who dedicate many, who, is, who have dedicated many years to our organization and are knowledgeable about their responsibilities. They guide and mentor others and provide a sense of continuity and familiarity to our students and our families. We are truly fortunate to have such committed employees in our district and um, it is an honor to recognize them for their service tonight and wish them the best as they move into the next chapter of their lives. So first, please join me in recognizing Sherry David from El Moro. for 23 years in the Laguna Beach Unified School District. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I'm the top of the world. Oh, there you Most go. Most of El Moro. Mm -hmm. And I've had, I've had the uh, honor and pleasure of working with Sherry for the last 12 years. Um, and it's, it will seem strange uh, not working with her next year. But uh, a couple things uh, about Ms. Sherry that I think we all would like to honor and recognize. And first of all, whatever I say here tonight will not be enough of a tribute to the contributions you've made to the kids in your classroom. I thought you were going to say you remained anonymous or something. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. Uh, you know, Sherry is excited about teach, just as exciting about teaching right now as she was 12 years ago when I met her. And she uh, never wastes a moment in the classroom. She always is planning what she's going to be doing. The kids are constantly interacting with her. She loves teaching them. She's a, a reading specialist, so that's a particular area where she loves to focus on. And to see her do reading groups with the kids and just turn on that light and that joy and love of reading for all the kids is just a wonderful thing to be able to observe. It's a tribute that she, there are students here uh, who have been in, uh, in Sherry's class. They heard that she was retiring. They stopped by her uh, colleagues, teachers. Um, I know that she's loved by the parents because she always communicates with them about what's going on in the classroom. Only the good things. Only the good things, <laughs> yes. Uh, she, she keeps them informed of what's happening. I, I don't know if I would just say it's only the good. Everything that's going on, the parents feel informed. I think they always appreciate that. So, Sherry, congratulations on a job well done. I wish the folks at home could see 
but you have your Birkenstocks on today. <laughs> and uh, yeah. again, we've worked together for 13 years, and she always wears Birkenstocks. <laughs> Sometimes with socks oh, yeah. when it gets cold. <laughs> See, That's right. And I wear a four and a half double D, so find a pocket. Find a pocket. <laughs> I've never seen Kathy in pumps, but I, I will say what I have seen Kathy do is be very passionate about educating kids in fourth grade at El Moro. And one of her specialties is science. So if you've ever been to her classroom or you haven't had a chance to be in uh, Kathy's classroom, there are snakes in the classroom. There's snake skins, which she tried to give away to the staff that nobody wanted because she has this huge snake skin that she's had for quite a while. Uh, but... Uh, She's always been the resident science expert at El Moro. So whenever there is a rattlesnake that might wander its way onto the campus, we call Kathy, who used to have a shovel that said snake on it. And <laughs> saved the day with the, uh, with, with, with the snake shovel. But uh, she has uh, a lot of fun. She's also, uh, she also has a master's degree in technology. <laughs> And they're laughing because this might be a little known fact, but I have to say it has served you well as we have changed the ways of education and Kathy's been able to make that adjustment and incorporate technology into her classroom. And, you know, just today we were talking about the writing online and tech giving support. the assessment and <laughs> tech support. So uh, it, she's shown a great ability to adapt and change over those years and not be stuck in her ways and continue to learn and continue to have a positive impact on the students at El Moro. And she is also well liked by all the students, all the parents, and all of the teachers who are here supporting <laughs> teachers when you taught science at both campuses mm -hmm. because they had to move all their stuff. She was a science teacher for our history. And obviously we've made a lot of progress yes. since we had to have it in a little room. But sometimes I would get the sub in there, times when I wasn't on the board, and it was a lot of fun. But I, and again, I have to say, since I had a child that went to El Moro, you guys were mostly TLW folks, that I, Kathy is really, really strong in teaching to the different learning styles of students. And for the since we have a room full of teachers, you know how important that is. And again, it's Stella. Thank Same you. as with Sherry. And Thank you. Really, really mm -hmm. have contributed so much. And she's a little local. And <coughs> I brought my mother in class of 55. <laughs> school 
And I get down by the truck. I don't even know if you're going to remember this story. Charles Flack. Charles Flack. And she was literally following behind, running at the edge of a bike as a senior boy is trying to learn how to ride the bike. And she's holding on the bike, running, sweating. I mean, okay, it's like, and it was just that one moment. Nobody else, this wasn't for anybody else other than this senior boy. And when he finally had the hang of it, as a senior boy learning to ride a bike, she let go and he was riding and she stood there and cheered and supported and I was like a mess because <laughs> it was so amazing to see her. And I think just like any other parent who have, would have pride in this coordination accomplishment, riding a bike, <laughs> Eleanor ran and ran and then finally let go to celebrate. The senior boy was riding a bike and I loved it. It was amazing. And that's a metaphor for who Eleanor is, right? She's always right beside her students. She's holding on to them, and then she's letting go right when she needs to let go. That sincere approach to supporting all students is what made Eleanor so very successful at Thurston. She is tireless, she is genuine, and she is focused, and she is successful with her students. I can confidently say that any student that had the great fortune to work with Eleanor was a successful student. Eleanor, we're going to miss you for so many reasons that I hope you come back to say hello, and I hope you come back and do our bulletin board. <laughs> <laughs> that's equally important. <laughs> had a great run. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's been wonderful. I love everything about this fall. I think Disneyland has knows nothing. <laughs> Thurston is the happiest place on earth. Oh. I mean, we have the great, greatest students, greatest staff, you know, greatest kids. It's just, it's a wonderful place. One thing I don't like, waking up at 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't like. That's not too bad. And I'm finally going to join my husband in retirement. My husband, Peter. Yeah. And my lovely daughter-in-law are here. My brother. -in -law. Jenny stole my thunder. Those bulletin boards have never looked yeah. so good. When I come back, and, you know, I know the hours. I've watched you, the hours that you put in with each student, and it really is. Um, it's remarkable, and the the value you add to their lives is is palpable. Yeah, I just love all the kids. Charles that I taught to ride a bike, we were going to continue to teach him how to swim because they're a swim teacher. But... Um, he bakes the groceries at Pavilions. Mm -hmm. I think you all know Charles. He's wonderful. He's mm -hmm. a great guy. So well, it's a what, pleasure. For me, what Jenny focused on is what I observed when you were still at the high school. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just the students that you worked with. You had an ability to know things about other students and then to compliment them on it. And know that that is important in a student's life, to have someone acknowledge something that they've done. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I experienced with uh, my son personally, but it makes, that's who you are, you're a gentle soul, and it makes a huge difference. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and last but not least, I'll introduce Mike Holland, who will introduce uh, and recognize Claudia Redford. Woo! Um, and it would not be the school it is today 
without the role that you played in it. And just from the impact you've had on all of the people in the room, from the many retired um, teachers that were here, to all the students that have come through, I think the, the, the one thing I always think about Claudia is she, <clears throat> she you'll come in the office once, and she, you're her best friend. She'll know everything about you. She could probably, and I'm sure she can do this, she could name five facts about every single person sitting in a chair right here. <laughs> Something you probably would not want her saying in public, but she has, she, she, she knows everything. Um, and again, it, it's it's beautiful connection to the community because you, this, you love and adore Laguna Beach, and you take so much pride in TOW and your passion for the school and your passion for the students. It, uh, it, it comes through, and like I said, it's... We could not, I could not do my job, and the rest of us could not do our job without, without the work and the tireless effort that you put in. So, um, <laughs> but she's not leaving the city, so uh, she, she's going she's to be close. But like, like I said, um, I could talk forever, but again, you are absolutely amazing, and you've done so much for the school. Like I said, it's been the last three years working with you has been incredible, um, like I said, and just you are, you are the heart. And like I said, the 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 the, the, uh, the joke is, you know, she she's the brain, like I said, because she knows she knows everything. She has a book called The Brain, so we're lucky that we have that in writing. So most of that's in there is now documented. But like I said, it's it's going to take dozens of people to to replace the just the brain power and 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 and, and, and the effort and just the work and, and dedication that you put into TOW. So thank you for all your years of service. We truly appreciate it. It's a great place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, I think you might have a few words to share. Chris <laughs> even called me this afternoon to pick my brain on, on yeah, people so, and, and principles and how far they go back. So. Encyclopedia. Yeah. So anyway, if I can bore you all for just a few minutes. <laughs> no, right? no. no? Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll just start. Okay. As you can well imagine, some of my best friendships have been formed at Top of the World School since I've been there for 32 years. I won't say how old I am. I'm only about 40, but that's okay. <laughs> I want to introduce a couple of people as I go through my speech. And Tony Flores is the teacher who hired me for this year. But you're, she's kind of like the Kathy Vick of El Moro. Um, we find a snake. <laughs> She'll go get the snake. She'll bring it to her classroom. And she'll skin it and put it, nail it to a board. <laughs> <laughs> right? Science guy. Science guy. Yeah. Yeah. Where is she? It's a good 40 minute lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Connie Flores is the one that I have to blame for this job. She said to me one day, school had already started, my youngest daughter was in fifth grade, and she said, what are you going to do? You can't go to Burston and be a helicopter mom, you know? <laughs> you, why don't you come and get paid? You've already been there, done that. And so I went home and talked to my husband, and he said, so long as you're home at night, because he traveled for a living as a pilot, and I needed to be the constant. And so there I was, and here I am. So <laughs> thanks, Tony. You're welcome. Yes, okay. Um, she also said to me that I, already, I knew all of the machines, and I can relate to Sherry David. Where did Sherry go? All right. I knew how to run a ditto machine. I knew how to use a stencil cutter. I knew how to use a typewriter. You're looking at me because these are four. I know what they are. <laughs> because I can't wrap my brain around Beachport and Haiku and... Yeah. 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 Roy's gonna miss your daily phone. I know, he's gonna miss it. Roy here? He's not. Yeah. He's not. yeah, okay. So anyway, my daughter started their education, and this is part of the history of my life, um, at Laguna Beach Unified School District at Aliso School down at Wesley by the Montage. And... Um, Jan Vickers was back in my life back then because Carl Schwartz, who was our school board president, and Lyle Proctor, who was a principal that I was PTA president under, um, set me off to the top of the world. And that's where I, my children continued their education when they closed Aliso School. So if Aliso was still open, you might not have met me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lucky man that it, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then the next person in my life that has made a huge difference is Diane Bridges. 
reasons at, at El Moro, and she's been my friend and my rock for, I don't know, we did election at my house. We were both election officers years ago, and my garage was a polling place, and so, Diane, so anyway, she and her husband have watched out over me after I became a widow, which that doesn't always happen, so. Um, Chris Hammerquist is not here this evening, but Chris was a very good replacement, and I'm hoping that we can find just as good of a replacement for me as they did for Diane. Um, next, Nancy and Dick Wade. In the invitation that I think Lisa Winston sent to me, she said, bring your family. I don't have any family around here. My one daughter lives in Connecticut, and the other one lives in San Francisco. <laughs> and so Nancy and Dick Wade are the first people I met in Laguna Beach that I still know today. I mean, I met a lot of people 42, 43 years ago, but I did, wasn't continue friendship, and so I can invite the Wades to my house for leftovers, and you'd think I gave them a piece. <laughs> but anyway, and Nancy and Dick's son, Paul, went through Top of the World, at least, well, I was sorry, at least so. Top of the world, we're going to be high school, and also surf company grape here in town. If anybody needs a boogie board or a skateboard, there you go. <laughs> um, and I also have Margaret. Margaret. Yes, <laughs> Margaret Arnold was an original teacher at Top of the World School and retired. 2012. Do the math. I can't do that now. <laughs> anyway, um, Margaret Arnold. Thank you for encouraging me to live the good life by retiring. <laughs> Talking about technology here, every night if I turn on my iPad or something at 11.30 or whatever time I get to it, I keep getting these messages from Facebook that tell me I have 43 friends who want me to open it up and look and see what's there. I don't know about that. I, I'm not sure, but maybe I'll have time to look at it so can be sports. I don't know. Uh, so, and then everybody asks, when you retire, what are you going to do? What special trip are you going to take? So, yes, I do have several trips planned, but the one I'm most excited about right now is my trip to Iceland with my two daughters to celebrate my mm -hmm birthday. <laughs> And it happens to be, where's my friend Linda Barker? Linda Barker and I share the same birthday along with Princess Anne. <laughs> <laughs> my husband used to fly from LAX to Africa with a layover in Iceland, and he always came home with fascinating stories to tell our two young daughters. And so that's what my one daughter, I'm going to tell you lots of stuff that you don't need to know tonight, but fell, broke her arm very severely during the Boston Marathon. So she was home and not didn't have things to do except for play on her iPad. And she called me one day and she says, Mom, it's a big birthday. We're going to go to Ireland. And I said, OK, you plan the trip. I'm too busy right now. And so tickets are bought and we're on our way. So um, bye. <laughs> Send me a postcard. I will. I will. Um, so anyway, oh, by the way, Mr. Conlon, I will not be reachable even by text <laughs> when the office opens in August. That's where I will be. Best way to be. Absolutely. All right. I will be standing behind that double, water, double waterfall enjoying the breathtaking views of the Iceland countryside. So, all right. I will miss you all and all the wonderful friendships I have made. It certainly does not feel like 32 years, but when I look back at all I have all I have done in 32 years, I guess it's been a great ride. So, it has, and almost every one of the school board members have had children come through Top of the World School, and Dee's son came to Top of the World School before she abandoned us. I guess she talked to us. Did you teach at TOW? She did. Did you teach at TOW or just at Del Moro? No, I taught one of your daughters. Did you? 
office he closes the door behind him and I'm just uh oh and he said I just got a text message or whatever those new programs are <laughs> from from Dr. Valoria and I said yeah and he said well he got an uh, email or something from you about not turning in that data confirmation <laughs> Claudia's not going to take it. <laughs> so I knew when I walked in and I was rolling my time. And then I leave out the data confirmation. Of all so, um, you know, I, I've had a, a, the privilege of being able to stop at top of the world and see Claudia and check in when I walk in onto campus. And she always smiles. And I even offered it and said, let me buy you a new computer because that screen is so small. She says, leave it alone. I know I haven't changed at all. <laughs> because if it gets bigger, it gets harder to work on. So um, I, I'm just so appreciative of all the things that you do for our kids, my own kid as, as well. And my daughter um, has said that same thing. She mm -hmm. said, uh, she's sad that you're leaving. She doesn't understand retirement. Um, uh, she thinks she just kind of wander off and, and disappeared in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, she's going to go do fun things like travel, which is going to be exactly what you deserve to do. So thank you for all your You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. I want to say a quick comment from the PTA moms. It is a known entity when we're planning for something. We actually say this, you need a Claudia. <laughs> and that is from any school because we'll say what you did for all of us and our kids. You helped us. I was really scared of you when I first met you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then I became PTA president. We became fast friends, and we worked hard. But I just will say, your name. Oh, you need a Claudia, and it just means someone with a commitment, a strong work ethic, gets the job done, organized. I so appreciate you for all the hundreds of kids you have helped to go through that. Claudia, I have to say, I was I was afraid too. Yeah. <laughs> know things I probably should have known. Yeah, and that's like I didn't know, I was just told, oh, you planned this field trip. And I thought, oh, all right. And I didn't know we used like 
district buses. I called a luxury bus in Tuscan. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The kids were all so surprised. It had, you know, the big full back seat. <laughs> Years and years later, and you're you're still there. And I was a little afraid of you all over. Because <laughs> I was like, there's something I don't have. I know there's something I don't have. I don't have. I don't have. People don't want to make you. We don't want to disappoint you. Disappointed. Yeah. Well, That's a huge you thing. You you're you're, you're, right. you're right. so efficient. dedicated. Well, you're so I'm a taskmaster. I'm sorry. I know he tells me all the time. <laughs> you keep him in line. Is basically what he says. So I appreciate that. Because otherwise, <laughs> I wasn't afraid of you. <laughs> myself the same because I walked in and I was like, look, my house burned down and we're supposed to be going to school here and I'm not going to go to school here because I'm moving back up here. And you're like, that's fine. <laughs> that's okay. And so I was not afraid of you. And I'm still not afraid of you <laughs> because you have the heart that everyone should have for families, for kids, for parents. <laughs> You've been there. I've been there with you too. I don't have parents. And you, Tina, but you in particular, and Diane, they have been so important to my family, to me. I can never, ever say thank you. And I mean that. You know, I know. So I'll leave the best to you and the girls as you move forward. I will miss you. I know I'll see you. But no, not at 5.30 in the morning when you're walking. So. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of time. But I do. You're, you are the roots that make this tree so, so special. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Well, we were reminiscing a little bit today about Eloise Dickerson. If yes. anybody, if anybody has remembers Eloise, probably not. <laughs> you know, you know, no, you know Eloise Dickerson. Oh my gosh! Oh, come on. Yeah. Anyway, Eloise always said when she left that she would, she could, she could write a book. So hearing you tonight, that's what you need to do. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you would be a bestseller <laughs> about all the good. Yeah, all well, it is. Yeah. Thank you for your years of service. My first memory of Ketta Brown was, well, no, I, my first happy, happy memories of Ketta Brown. Annie, we would get boxes for her, and Ketta would come up to school to do whatever she would do. We'd put her in boxes, and she'd curl around inside the box and move it around you like a little gerbil inside a box, and she'd entertain herself while her mom was visiting PTA president or whatever she did. That was a really good parent. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. Uh, I feel privileged to be able to work with people uh, like Sherry. Um, and but she was one of the first people that, uh, when I introduced myself at Omoro, who um, made, was the only one who actually asked a question in the whole entire room at, at first. And um, I've always appreciated that because um, you ask the right questions, you support your staff, the people you work with. Um, same with Eleanor. I mean, every time I walk on a campus at Thurston, um, I can, whenever I see her, she's always smiling. The kids know it. Um, they, they just, she is infectious when she's around. 
And Kathy, when I get to go into your room, she says, thanks for stuff. Um, and you know, she mentions to me, like, when I walk into the room, she's like, the kids always say, who's that guy in the back of the room standing in the suit? She always just keeps going, keeps teaching. Um, and as Jan pointed out, um, there's always something going on in your room that's positive for kids. And so I just thank you. And I'm not going to go into any more detail because you're quite a similar story about me. But um, <laughs> you know, this is what uh, this is what this business is about: is people and students and doing what we think is best. And so I'm just um, privileged to work with you. Saddened to know that you guys are retiring, but know that you deserve to retire and do great things in your retirement. So thank you for your years of service. Much appreciation. Thanks. Okay, we should just stop now. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming to support your fellow teachers. It, it, it really says what this district is about, and I appreciate that and support. Thank you. Um, next, we are recognizing um, community, part, community Coalition and the Partnership and Convention at uh, uh, Thursday. Mission Hospital, and I'm here on behalf of the Laguna Beach Community Coalition. The coalition works to prevent substance use and to support you to have healthy relationships and strong community connections. Today, we'd like to honor Thurston Middle School with our first Partners in Prevention Award. Thurston dedicated an entire week to mental health awareness and stigma reduction with the goal of making it easier to talk about mental health. And they reminded the students that taking care of their minds is as important as taking care of their bodies. Thurston involved the staff, the students, and the parents in this week-long campus-wide event. The school counselors taught mindfulness and relaxation techniques, and they hosted a beach chair lunch, featuring an opportunity for student-teacher connectedness. Thurston has helped to reduce the stigma around mental health by treating their students with respect and compassion. This campus-wide celebration of Mental Health Week is a lovely example of how inclusion and connectedness in our school communities help support the young people and help them become more resilient. We want to thank the staff and the families and the students at Thurston Middle School and honor them with this award. Great, I probably wasn't looking because you took so long. Thank you. Next we have Workability Business Partnerships. Yes, so Mrs. Irene White is going to come up and introduce us and introduce the award, the recognition. What a fun evening. <laughs> Good evening. I'd like to introduce Cindy Kimball, who's our workability TPP specialist, as well as Chris Costley, who's joined our team this year as our workability technician, and they've done incredible work, and we're here tonight to present to you um, some employers that have been supporting our children. Great. So one of the things that we do, one of the many things that we do is we um, establish partnerships with, with um, community businesses um, that help us by providing work experience opportunities for our students that are in need of work experience. And so we would like to recognize some of those really wonderful employers because we appreciate them so much and their um, patience and diligence and really giving these kids an opportunity at their first chance at their first job. So I don't know if we have everyone here, but we'd like to start off with um, recognizing Radio KX 93.5. We're, we're counter shy people. We can't hide the radio. <laughs> Just to give a, a shout out, 
they will be running their first ever radio camp this summer, right. which is very exciting for students that are interested in an opportunity to run their own radio program. Right. It's been a great program. Thank you for the opportunity. We're really excited to work with the youth and um, teach them all things business, radio-wise, and communication, and technology. <laughs> I think we're really lucky because I don't think there's too many other communities that have their own local radio station I think so too. that kids get to go get involved in. So thank yes. you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next business is the kitchen, in the, uh, kitchen in the Canyon. So Chef Patrick, uh, we actually met him through our cooking class for our, our kids. And what we found out about Chef Patrick was that he's amazing with all types of kids. So he's the chef who's teaching six or seven, eight sometimes, um, but first class cooking skills. And then we made wonderful meals and one of the parents said, one of the best things about this class is that she gets she gets a night off. She makes a side salad, and she has the rest. So <laughs> we'd like to thank Chef Patrick for all that he does. Thank you. Chris. Patrick, don't run off the oh, So when I first showed up with Patrick, we were making lasagna, <laughs> and of course they offered uh, to make me a. a plate, but one of the students kept eating all the noodles uh, as he was making his lasagna, so I said, no, go ahead and take the extra home. But um, what I noticed, and I just have to say, um, the kids, they loved you. Thank you. The, the, you connect with students, you connect with staff, and you made it fun. Thank you. And I well, appreciate that. What's been great for me, real quickly, is Cindy and, and Chris talked to me about the potential of hiring a couple of boys and girls, and we did, actually, so far. I've had two Calebs, Caleb 1 and Caleb 2. Caleb one, two. And uh, Caleb 1 did 50 hours, Caleb 2 is in, has done 40 hours, he's got 10 more to do this weekend, and they've been amazing. Just wonderful, so we're hoping we can do So Caleb 1, more. actually, after his first cooking class, went home, told his dad all about this, and so now his dad's emailing me, can you give me some culinary schools that he, he this is what he wants to do for the rest of his life. He was amazing. He had never really done anything in the kitchen prior to that class. So it was really, it was great. Thank he you makes fantastic life. food, so go Thank ahead. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> place that we're all very familiar with. It's Zinc Cafe. John Suckerton is the owner. Uh, I approached John and told him about our program. He said, how many can I take? I mean, he truly is a part of this community, what, 25 years? 30. 30, 30 years. 2018. So when you think of Zinc, you think of great food and a beautiful atmosphere. What I see as someone who's placing uh, students is great management. The Employees love being there, and they do an excellent job. So I thought, what if, if we could get a couple of our kids in there each year? Each year. Each year. <laughs> <laughs> going forward, uh, we, uh, it would be a great thing. So thank you very thank much. You. Harrison so, is doing a great job. Yeah.
This is a good one. Laguna Playhouse. Cool. Wally. <laughs> There's Wally. So Wally is a great guy, not only because of his name, and some of our students love the movie Wally, but Wally is just a great, nice, kind man who um, works so well with some of our students. And um, we really appreciate you taking the time to teach them your craft. Well, thank you, and I, so, I appreciate this, too. I, I've been, not only before I met Cindy and uh, Chris, but we've been working with this, I've been working with this student for 27 years there at the Playhouse, but uh, Cindy and Chris have really upped the, uh, up the ante here, and we're getting more and more students there. So, And I've also worked with the special ed uh, children, too, and, and I love them all, and they do. I'm not a teacher, but um, I do help these kids learn all about the theater, and, and not only do they help us uh, with their working, they also get to see all the performances, and that way they're educated in, in what, we, what we show the, the kids there at the Playhouse. So thank you very much. All right, so last but not least. Oh, we've got two more. Oh, uh, do you want to take one? Oh, sure. So this one, you guys are all going to recognize. Chuck Taylor. Come on up. <laughs> to a lot of these students that we've placed with him. And he has really made a difference in their lives. He's been also patient with them, teaching them how to um, sign in and sign out of their timesheet and, and encouraging them that it's important to come to work every day and to be on time and all those things that are important, that are really important to learn. And um, so although so far we haven't had any students um, get jobs here with the school district as custodians, they, it has helped propel them into whatever their next job has been, so it's been a wonderful work experience for them. But I really appreciate you always being willing when I say, I have another student. You're like, okay, right. bring them in. So thank you so much, Chuck. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so last but not least. Um, Clark Collins from Collins Design and Development. So uh, Clark uh, has a very special role in the uh, community. He takes our, our cottages, right, uh, what we're known for, and the ones that need some TLC, and he turns them into, brings them back to the period, and in a superb way. So if you ever see one of his open houses, you really have to see it because you get into these cottages and you think you're back in the 40s or 30s. You think Betty Davis is walking her dog down the street. <laughs> so uh, it's truly, uh, it's he does a great job. He has uh, a lot of talent. So when we assess our students, um, you know, we try to get to know where they want to go, what they want to do, and they tell us different things. So uh, one student I had wanted to do interior design. And luckily, being from the neighborhood uh, or the community, I thought, I think I know someone, and so I approached Clark a couple weeks later, and I said, hey, you know, this is our program, and to put it into perspective, other districts have set programs where they go to the big box stores, and they put a dozen students in every year, and they have someone to, to really guide them through. So when we go to a business, a lot of times it's, well, you know, it might be tough. But then they stop and they say, I'll do it. You know, just let me know what I need to do. I'm willing to uh, help these students out. So we have a student who's learning his craft, and, you know, that is an amazing thing. Yeah, so, she's fantastic. So really, really appreciate it. All right. Before these two lovely yes. people leave, I certainly need to acknowledge all of their efforts. Mr. Costley came to us um, as a successful businessman. He has a passion for working with kids. 
wants to educate and he landed this position and time and time again you know we we laugh about how he's overqualified <laughs> for his role but the gifts that he brings to us um, is priceless and so meaningful cindy obviously changed her role when corey brown left us and has moved into a leadership role role with TPP and workability and has done an amazing job. The community partnerships that they're bringing to our students is, is phenomenal. Years ago, we didn't have a TPP program. Oh, about 10 years ago, we didn't have a TPP program. And at that time, we were graduating children, students that basically stayed home on couches because they were not going to go to community college for one reason or another or a vocational program. And I can honestly tell you that that doesn't happen to our kids anymore. We're reaching out to them, we're connecting them with real life experiences in an effort so that they can find their passion. Um, so I want to thank you both for all your work. You know I love you both. <laughs>
Um, and I think we would hope the district would just maintain that equity going forward now they know it's a requirement. Um, the other things are, are easy to fix. The annual evaluations, that really that requirement really supports that the state wants districts to understand these programs. And maybe the district could do a couple years of these evaluations going forward um, before deciding to make any change that changes that would have long-term implications for the programs. Um, the teachers, I, again, not the intent, but people kind of walked away thinking that um, nobody wanted to teach at CLC. So, so I wanted to emphasize that we are looking right now internally at a very limited pool of volunteers. And there are people in the community who want to teach at CLC. And the last time we took applications from the outside world, we had a lot. So um, I just wanted to mention that. And then fiscal responsibility, that was a big focus in the last meeting. And it is very important. And it happens in service of the children's education. Um, it's the fifth out of five strategic goals for the district, and it says the district will maintain fiscal solvency and transparency to ensure support of student learning. Solvency is not short-term cost cutting. It is the ability to meet long-term financial obligations. Um, now, if the district has a solvency problem, you know that might change things. I, I'm not aware of that. Uh, but every year we have 35 to 50 families who want a spot at CLC. That is 20 to 25% of all incoming first grade families who want this particular alternative program, a whole child looping, multi-graded four-year parent participation program. That is the referendum on the value of the program. So please show us how you are using that fiscal responsibility to support student learning for those families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kim Lensing. So fiscal responsibility was a term that was used a lot at the last meeting, and I had to sit with myself and ask myself, what does fiscal responsibility mean, right? So hiring two teachers, if we don't need those two teachers, that's fiscal responsibility. But I would also say that fiscal responsibility is taking a step back and looking at the whole picture, right? So what are the underlying values of the program? What's the overall return on the money already spent? Do people in the community want an alternative school? Look at the enrollment at Annalise and the Montessori schools. Do people in this community want an alternative school? I would ask that we do an analysis and study if people in the community want an alter alternative school, and if it is fiscally responsible to tear down a program quickly without really doing the study, if it makes sense for our community. It feels like it's a rash and quick decision being made. Um, to me, it felt like options were just quickly thrown out at the meeting without study, quickly thrown out as, hey, let's look into these without really taking the time to evaluate these options. One of these options is a first through fourth grade class. That's not gonna be a good option. So that leaves us with three other options. One of the options is closing the program. I think we need to take the time to step back and look at what does it mean to be fiscally responsible? What does this community and this district want to provide to these children? Just last year, we decided to build buildings called the CLC buildings. $2 million were approved to replace the trailers that had been there for years with new CLC buildings. The new temporary buildings are there now. Our kids took all their artwork off of the walls right before open house so that they could move into these temporary buildings so that the new buildings could be built, the CLC buildings. That was last year, and now we're not sure if we're going to have the program. I would ask that we take a step back and look at fiscal responsibility from a less myopic view, a, a grander view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next card is from Carrie Dos 
Doshi and Neil. Good evening, my name is Perry Doshi O'Neill. I have a student who's currently in third grade at CLC and a student who graduated from CLC and is a top of the world at this school right now. Um, I want to thank um, all of you for taking the time to hear us. We heard you at the last meeting, and I especially want to thank Dee for writing back to my daughter. She wrote a handmade card asking that CLC be saved, and she really appreciated the fact that the school board was willing to hear her and explain to her where you are coming from. And in that response, um, you know, the fiscal responsibility, the inability to hire new teachers was brought up. And that's just what I kind of want to touch on is um, we, if we are constrained by hiring within our um, school district, I would ask that um, you as the board and the administration help promote and encourage the current teachers to consider CLC um, as an opportunity for them to start, either continue what's there or create their own alternative education program. Um, with the mishirings, with what's happened over the past two years, it is, you know, just as a human, it's difficult to say, well, I'm gonna leave my position here teaching third grade and take a risk over here at CLC. And, um, you know, parents want the program, new um, students want to come in and what I ask is if administration would consider I appreciate that Lisa sent out the um, individual you know application here this is open until the 26th of May not just in the lump that was done previously but you know that was an amazing effort and I appreciate that but I wonder if maybe if administrators if, if teachers could hear administration say we are evaluating this program but if you are interested in alternative education, if you are interested in contributing to TOW as a campus, taking CLC, making it your own, because as we discussed, this program is going to thrive and succeed with teachers that have the passion, just like Cheryl and Leah had, with a school board that supports them and wants to see it succeed. I am uncertain in my view, and I am not a teacher on this campus, so this is just my view, whether, the teachers feel that yes, the administration and school board would support me in making this leap from my classroom. So I ask you to please consider maybe making a statement or whatever is appropriate in your role to let teachers know if there's someone out there that's interested in trying this and trying to make this program happen because we got interest. We want to, there are people, there are students that want an alternative program to give it a chance and that your administration would support. Jordan's into cats. My name is Jordan, and I'm a third grader in CLC. CLC is a great place. Parents come into CLC and do fun projects like art, maker space, and yoga. Please do not cancel CLC. We have been waiting a long time for new buildings. If CLC was canceled, we would get really excited for our new classrooms that were promised to us. And then the school, the school board, the principal, they all promised us the right of new buildings. The unique thing about CLC is the grade notes. When I was in the first grade, I didn't know anything. So I asked the second grader, can you help me? Or what are you doing? Second grader has helped me a lot in reading school. Plus, I could not take on top of the world if CLC was canceled. Every time if I looked for CLC at them, I would feel horrible. I would remember the place where the joy of my life was. My dream is to come up with a CLC in fourth grade graduation speech. I could not take that pressure. Please do not punish the kids in CLC for less students next year. Kelly Zenser, Jordan's mom. She really wanted to come and speak. Um, I had to talk to her about what was going on because of the newspaper article that came out a couple Fridays ago. So, um, and I do want to say very quickly, we loved Claudia too. We loved Claudia too. <laughs> and she told us to vote for Ketta Brown because she'll watch out for the children. So, um, 
Anyway, Jordan would not have been able to speak with you, to you without CLC. You should have seen her in first grade. They have to do presentations all the time, and it's the same group of kids and parents, and she could barely speak. So this took a lot of courage. Um, I just want to, I've, I've been ruminating since the last meeting, and um, I'm a lawyer, and so I'm looking at all the ed code, and it's very short for alternative schools. It's very easy to read. Um, but, and I've looked at the district's purpose and strategies and goals, and it's the district's job to hire and retain excellent teachers. And one of your strategic goals is the district will recruit, hire, train, and retain high-performing staff. It is not CLC's fault that we have two teacher resignations and that you all, you know, like it's the district's responsibility to hire, train, and retain teachers. Okay? Um, it's, CLC should not be punished for teacher resignations. Um, I know CLC can be great with the right teachers. I know enrollment will increase. I know that CLC will improve. It will, um, and I don't think you can effectively evaluate CLC with no teachers. So let's get some good teachers in there, and then let's evaluate the program. And you have to evaluate every year anyway. Um, the teachers do not have to be volunteers within the district. I know the code says teachers and students are volunteers, but. It's not limited to this pool within the district, according to code. Uh, we would love to have district teachers. They're talented. But I also know a lot of them are really happy in the jobs they have. So um, also, I just want to bring up that my understanding of the, and Lisa Winston can speak more to this, but my understanding of the way teachers are hired, and it came up, kind of brought up this up, you can in good conscience, hire teachers. They're all probationary for two years. So. Um, the other thing I want to mention is in the code, it talks about funding shall be at the same level as other educational programs, not that it may be, it's mandatory. So the funding issue for potentially closing CLC doesn't seem to fit with the code. Um, also, parents can request alternative school at any time, that's code 58502. I don't I think we've got a good alternative school and we don't want to have parents like requesting for more alternative schools willy-nilly. So let's work on the one that we have. Thank you. Are there any uh, others who wish to speak and public comment on non-agenda items who have not turned in the card? Delinquent again. <laughs> Thank you, board member. Yeah, you know, I don't uh, watch TV, but I was on a plane back from Washington and I watched this sh uh, TV show called uh, Little Big Lies, or Big Little Lies. And they actually had a discussion between um, a couple moms uh, about the fact that the public schools in their town were more like private schools because the parents, you know, this is something we've heard here in Laguna Beach. Our schools are as good as private schools because we give a lot of money through school power and you know and so um you know i was thinking about that a lot because you know i've always said we never want public schools to be governed the way private schools are governed and we um and people in private schools don't want to have their schools governed the way public schools are governed. then i was thinking about it you know board president vickers um was quoted in the orange county register last year saying the school board doesn't run the schools and yet the education code says the school board does run the schools. Now, obviously, we don't want the school board to micromanage educator, educators. We've got a wonderful celebration here tonight of some great educators. But you all are not educators. You're not here as educators. You're here to govern the school district. And I've been in, I want to speak with respect to this issue of the CLC because what I've been saying to the school board for the last 10 years is that the superintendents should be sent, you should invest, if you really care about your superintendents, you should invest in them by sending them to the Kennedy School of Government. If they go to the Kennedy School of Government, they would learn that in any decision-making process like this, you have three 
spheres that you need to combine. You have your values, your community values, you have your capacities, and you have your stakeholders. This situation that's developed up at CLC is a classic case study at the Kennedy School of Government of a lack of governance by the school board to combine and have those three spheres overlap. Those spheres have been disintegrated by what's happened here. And it all began, or at least for me it all began, uh, a couple of years ago when I opposed the transferring of funding from the Rainy Day Fund into the building fund for building projects that included the CLC buildings, not because I was against the CLC buildings, but I didn't think that the building program had received the right kind of deliberation and input. And I didn't think that you should be spending, taking $10 million, actually it was $12 million, out of the $17 million rainy day trust fund that took 15 years to, to accumulate, you took it all and spent it on a very short notice without the community really deliberating over how that money was going to be used. At the same time, you have a $30 million unfunded pension obligation that as far as I know, there's no strategy for dealing with. And so we're just giving, we're celebrating the retirement of all these teachers, that's great. Are we gonna be able to pay the retirement pensions of the teachers that retire in the future? I'm out of time now, but I just wanna say that um, my objection to the, the whole approach to the CLC project was that you didn't involve the values, the capacities that we have at CLC and the stakeholders and have full deliberations before you spend a lot of money and the last thing I'll say is this. Mr. Lamseedle said that this building project was going to be the board's legacy. Well, I'm afraid the legacy of the board that Mr. Lamseedle was talking about is a lot of uh, people that were given expectations that are now being frustrated. And uh, it's a classic case study of poor governance. Are there any other public comments for items not on the agenda? Okay, we'll finish that section and move on to reports from Board of Representatives, and we don't have a student at the evening. Too much question. <laughs> so we moved to Alupa to share Sarah. Good evening, everybody. Well, that was a wonderful ceremony that you guys gave all the educators. And I know that either my children had those teachers, or I worked with them, or um, and they will be missed, and their tribal knowledge will be missed, and not, you know, it'll take a while for us to get used to not having them around. Um, but also, I would like to um, thank the PTA for Teacher Appreciation Week and for our little bags we got. That was fun. It was fun to go in our boxes and see we have these little gifts and open those up and to wake up that morning and think, oh, let's be teacher appreciation lunch and I don't have to make lunch. <laughs> and, um, and it's always delicious. So that was great. And then um, Yachty and our foreign language department attended a, and Mindy, I think, attended a CTA um, ethnic minorities conference and they are moving ahead together to plan for um, a cultural fair at the high school. So um, we will look forward to that, and they hopefully will get that, are looking to do that here in June, so that's it. Good evening. Yes, I will also would like to thank the administration for a lovely retirement party. I know um, CSEA and our classified members of tonight really have been the backbone of this community, uh, both of them. So I truly appreciate the time that was taken this evening. And on uh, PTA, as far as uh, staff appreciation, we, we all enjoyed the appreciation of getting things in our boxes and the food and all of the things, especially at TOW, we have a special lunch and it's kind of exciting that everybody looks forward to. And um, th you know, on a positive note, uh, CSCA has finished negotiations, so I thank the administration and the board. You have a diligent team here. We worked in my uh, side, uh, we worked hard to get to where we are. I feel we have something that's very positive to move forward with. I am waiting for it to get through 610 policy, and if I have to live 610 policy anymore, I am just over it, to be honest with you, because we have such exciting things, and I want to move forward with it. 
We will be voting on June 7th and 8th on the sites with our site representatives. And I will be letting the principals know exactly who those people are and what we're doing at the before school, after school, during break, and like you so it will not interfere with any of the day's activities of work. And then um, we will have it ratified at our June 14th meeting. But we'd like to make sure that all of you, you'll be getting this flyer, stop by the June 14th barbecue to recognize our classified staff again, our GEM Award, which is a secret at the moment, and just be a part of the celebration, even if you can only come by for five or 10 minutes, we'd really appreciate it. And I know the classified staff appreciates seeing all of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any representatives of organizations? School Power, PTA? Well, I'm here, but I'm well, sure. Just she left, she left, okay. Tammy was here earlier, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were out last time. Okay, hey, board members, if you have, this is a time to report on anything you represented as an act. Maybe a report. Committee. Okay. School power now, and they talked about future grants, which was very that exciting. It, I think it's mm -hmm. done. Done. Yeah, they voted on okay. everything, and, and, and yeah, they will be very pleased. So they work hard on it, so it's good. Mm -hmm. Are you guys going to talk?
like to invite um, Irene White to the podium. As you know, she's extraordinary and she's been leading the way. She has a fun update for us this evening. Yes, fun. Are we ready? Yes. 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 Typically, when we talk about special education, it's not always a fun topic to talk about. Um, but tonight will be. I do have a presentation for you. So, first of all, thank you for allowing me to provide a special ed update. Tonight, I'm going to highlight some specific things that we're doing on each of the campuses. And clearly, these folks over here are instrumental in making sure that all those things are carried out. And um, they are fabulous to work with. Um, as you know, we serve lots of different kinds of kids within our school district, and they all have a variety of needs. And the truth is that um, they all come to school with a desire to learn. For some, we know that it's harder than for others. But one of the things that we know and that we've been able to create in our district is a learning environment um, where we have truly blurred the lines between special education and regular ed. It's a hard tightrope walk. And sometimes there's even criticism that, that says maybe we've learned too far, that our special ed teachers are working more with general ed kids or vice versa. But I can tell you that it's a wonderful thing and many districts um, across the state desire to be able to create these inclusive environments on behalf of children. Um, it's hard to be called special. It is not an identification that is welcome by many. I want you to watch this. Our kids are unique, they're remarkable, and the takeaway from that short little clip, special needs kid, and did you hear the audience? Did you hear the kids rally support? Uh, it was an amazing experience that I know that uh, Mindy Hawkins had shared with me, and obviously the amplification isn't great, but honestly it can bring you to your knees. It's really easy here to be proud of our inclusive environment. The other morning, last Tuesday, and Jason told me only five slides. Um, and Alicia said only five slides, but it's really hard. I did put it all with five slides, and, I, and I'm really trying to be brief. But I have to tell you this story. The other morning, as I frequently do, as we all do, we make calls in the morning on the way into the office. I did two um, as I'm going to work. One was one of the special ed advocates that I work closely with. And he was telling me that, Irene, I'm doing the best I can to kind of work with you, but the parent may lawyer up. Um, because they want you to fund after school tutoring five days a week. Kids in private school, he's getting that. They feel like if he comes here from private school, you need to fund that. So I hang up the phone, it's cordial, you know, we're going to be moving into an IEP. So the second call was a father of four students and in the district. And one of the things he said to me was, Irene, since my mother died, you are the second most influential woman in my life. I don't share that with you to um, say that I'm anything special, but these families trust us to make good decisions on behalf of their kids. And these parents, let me tell you, their journey hasn't been either easy. And they're looking to us to help us guide them. What Our jobs are complex requiring us to be present and responsive, no matter when and where we have to be in the moment, whether it's an assessment request for a child, whether it's a preschool student who's newly identified as autistic, whether it's a child move-in that has a tremendous amount of needs, we have to be responsive and present and available because we want to invest in their children and help them be successful. There are so many great things that we are doing um, in each of the elementary or at each of our sites, and I've listed out a few with the help of our psychologists, and I'd like to highlight those for you. Um, 
one of the things that we're always looking to do is look at what the research says about what's, what works. If we have kids that are continuing to not make progress, we don't want to continue to do more of the same, right? So we're always looking at advancing our expertise. So at the elementary level, we're using watchminders. That's a new revolutionary item. And you can see a young lady wearing a watchminder, and we're using it in general ed and in special education. And what we're finding is an increase in executive function skills. So no longer is an aide coming to prompt the kid, but they're looking at their watch to remind them to take either a sensory break or get back on track or whatever it is. So in addition to that, we've been running our fitness club the elementary sites and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to get those sensory needs met of students so that they can walk into the classroom ready to learn again it's not just special education identified kids it's regular ed kids too that are having certain types of issues that classroom teachers are reporting our data we're taking better data and it's reporting that it's effective we have kids whose teachers are reporting that they're more attentive after they participated in fitness club. We've talked about second step implementation in a previous presentation. And again, one of the things that I love is special ed is not a separate silo. I don't sit over there in my office and talk to just special ed people. All of our worlds overlap and integrate in every aspect of what we do. We've done great things as it relates to communication tools for IAs. They talk on walkie talkies at El Moro on the campus, making sure that if someone is an outlier, that someone's going there to be able to pull them in to a social situation or recognizing if the kid needs that break, they can alert that person that they're headed over to a certain end of the field. Our IA PLC model, we're really excited or I'm really excited about hearing from folks that want to include all of the IAs in our PLC because within special education, we got lots to talk about. We have to share strategies so that we can be successful. Um, lunchtime social facilitation project, fast forward growth that we've seen both at Top of the World as well as El Moro, making a difference for kids. From clipping up and down to using our aids to teach teachers to use Classroom Dojo as a better system for managing behavior. Training, training, training. That's what we're utilizing our sites and our specialists to do uh, regularly, weekly, daily, whatever it takes. At the middle school level, again, they're working on lunch, break, social facilitation project that we have in place through the Boys and Girls Club that we're continuing, which is exciting. We've seen more kids this year uh, receive accolades through the Special Visual Arts Honors, as well as the Blue and Gold Awards for Academic Achievement. Our investment in READ 180 has paid dividends. Our kids are making progress and they're moving out of those classes and are able to, are able to integrate at the middle school and the high school level in general education classes. Are we perfect? No, but we're working on it. Um, lead role, we have a student who's taken a lead role in the Lion King production. Our IAPLC, a lot of time there. We're paying them additional dollars because they can't find a time during their work day because they're going, going, going. So they can come in and at times in the morning and be able to participate in their general PLCs, but also let the aides have conversations because it's rich, meaningful, and it's helpful to know what the other person is doing. Collaborative teaching, we're investing um, dollars in sending teachers at Thurston Middle School to the Maryland Friend presentation at the county that's coming up here soon. Um, and it's expensive, folks. It's expensive to have two teachers in one classroom, but it is magical for both regular ed and special ed if you're able to do it well and pull it off. And we're continuing to try to do it. I just had a meeting today at Thurston Middle School this afternoon where the teacher stayed till 4.45. I missed my meeting with Mr. Duddy. Um, and we were talking about um, the collaborative teaching that they're doing at Thurston and how they want to do more of it. And part of it is yay, yay, yay. But part of it is we have constraints. We have a budget that we have to live within. So finding that balance and figuring out what those priorities are obviously an ongoing, ongoing journey. 
um, behavior interventions, mental health awareness, using special ed staff to work with general ed staff to create all those things is wonderful. And at the high school level, I'm not going to read all those for you. You can see that we do a lot of things in our department that we're really super proud of. You heard of their workability. You saw their genuine interest in our students. They're passionate. We're all passionate about what we do. Um, so it's exciting stuff. So when we take a look at trends and implications, oh gosh, there's a whole other slide. Beyond the school buildings. Wow, let me just pick one thing to share, because I'm getting the look. Um, no, I'm not getting the look. Um, oh, okay, I was told to put the big air jumping Irene with one of our with one of our students who happens to be blind. Look at her. Did you know that? No, she enjoyed it tremendously. And we're in the process of writing another grant for um, additional funds to be able to host another successful experience like that. When we invite our families to go to Saddleback CAC parent presentations, I get a handful, maybe five, if that. We have approximately 200 participants. There were our families enjoying each other, connecting together. Very powerful. So I'd love to talk about all those things, but I won't. Um, the next one, in the last 12 years, here's what we've seen. Special education numbers continue to increase. We're going to be over 400 kids um, by the time we get fall. I can pretty much assure you of that with the number of calls that we're getting about new things. Um, are we a destination district? We're a destination district in general ed and in special education. We have families that show up and they tell us they're here because they've learned about our program. Um, does that mean we're great? We do a good job? We're continuing on that road and trying to get better at our craft, um, but that's something that we're continuing to monitor. The autism population has almost tripled in the state. In our district, we went from 15 kids to 75 kids in the last 12 years. So that's five times. Our other health impaired population um, has doubled from 27 to 60. So the children that qualify in that particular area have either attention deficit issues, attention disorders, or they also have other maybe social emotional issues that do not necessarily warrant an ED eligibility. Specific learning dis dis disabled population has almost doubled from 57 to 111. And part of hearing one to, we had one 12 years ago, we now have six students. In all the, there are 13 eligibility categories. The reason why I share, I don't share the others is because they're either the same or they're lower. Okay. So these are the areas where we've increased our population. So what does that mean to us? It means that we, it's stretching on our resources, that we have to bring in more people to deliver the quality care that we've been providing them. We do exceed the statewide average for identified students at this time. Uh, we were under when I started here, so you can blame me. No, I'm kidding. Um, but but I, I bring that up not because um, I'm proud of that. I bring that up because one of the things that we've been gathering information on is who these kids are and their move-ins, folks. They're not necessarily kids that have been here. In fact, our high school members, as you know, have increased significantly or will increase next year. Um, significantly to the point where we're having to add a fifth teacher because there, there are four teachers who are going to be on be significantly beyond caseload limits. Supreme implications, Supreme Court ruling. There's been conversation about that this school year. I know Dr. Gloria sent you some information. I provided some information in the board packet as well. The implication for us um, is not as significant as it may be in other places. We really look at whether or not our children are making benefit. If our kids are not making progress, we're reconvening those IEP meetings and having conversations about what we need to do differently to get the progress that we need. Dyslexia legislation, that's going to help us blur the lines even further because one of the things that we know is that if we identify children earlier that they're not likely to require special education later down the road. So we formed a um, workforce task force and, oh my gosh, we did some great work within a short period of time. 
So with that said, I was going to show you a respectability video, but I'm going to tell you about it. And if you'd like to see it, we'll forward it to you via email. As you know, Mr. Deddy, we piloted it this year. We have one of our parent mentors. Well, she's not a parent mentor. She's our special education PTA liaison, which is one of the things that we've been able to accomplish this year at all the different campuses. This particular person had a passion about how can we do more related to teaching disabilities. And they've made their own videos at El Moro School once a week. There's teacher activities, and these videos are just incredible. The one that I wanted to show you was Coach Blanton and his story about stuttering and how he had to overcome that. And every week, three, two to three teachers or instructional aides have volunteered to be in this video to talk to kids about what they struggled with as children um, and how they overcame it. So it's very, very powerful. So if you're interested, we've been more than happy to make that available. Thank you. I apologize for talking so fast. Um, Sit there. I have questions. Okay, sorry. <laughs> questions? I love to see the video. Yeah. Kudos for all your work with that. And we're hoping to bring that respectability month, maybe call it something different on each of the campuses, but to incorporate those activities on our other sites moving forward next year and utilizing our parent mentors to make that happen. Any public comment on the presentation? We just have updated us on special ed. Thank you, Irene. It's, awesome. it's growing and growing, and that means that the services have to keep growing. I know it's, it's a lot, but I know that you really, you really identify it when you say that it has, it has been concerned with the families, and they do become others, and I know that's a big responsibility. And don't ever start that, you know, we like hearing this stuff. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. We like we hearing that all the things that are going on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to look at Before we move on, I, I want to uh, thank Irene because the one thing I can say with all of the growth and things over time, she and I have talked quite a bit about trying to support the role that she's in. And obviously, the new director of social emotional support I think will be extremely helpful because um, uh, the picture I had of Irene when I walked in the door and I was told very early on about the work that she does, she has her fingers in every little hole trying to keep everything going for kids. And everything that Irene does is about students. Um, she's so student first, and that's our program. And um, she's hiding behind Peggy, she can't see it. But um, what you saw was such a small list of all the things that she's done this year. And she's taken on even more things. Um, that we get, she and I get to work together tomorrow on some more things. Um, and I actually miss that her office isn't right next to mine, because I'm going to pop in and see what's going on all the time. But I do like going space which is perfect. But thank you and for all the work you do and Dr. Uh, Deacon for all your support as well. So thank you. Our next up um, information is update on the visual performing arts. Yeah. But, yes. So I'd like to bring Bridget Bridget Porter up to the front again. She will do part two of her presentation for the future. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> Um, so we're just going to go over what we've accomplished this year and our future goals. Um, we had the privilege of creating a K-12 arts planning team, and I was a part of this team. It was a great collaborative effort between administrators, school board members, community members, teachers, and we created a, an arts plan for our district um, that had wonderful outcomes. And so right now, what I've been doing, I've had this great privilege of being the BAPA coordinator, is growing our connections with the K-5 through visual and performing arts programs and working with our great team at El Moro and Top of the World. Uh, we have wonderful teachers and administrators, and it's just, we're just looking for more ways to integrate the arts and provide more engaging and meaningful uh, experiences for students. So this is a look ahead. Uh, we're also thinking about what we can do in the future school year to improve what we've done uh, and, and increase our efforts. So this is our mission for our K-12 planning arts planning team, and we want to provide exemplary arts education programs to ensure that every child uh, participates in high-quality K-12 arts learning, 
that leads to success in college and career and in the community in whatever field he or she pursues. So it's a noble plan and um, it's a five-year plan. So we implemented it with my position. And right now I've gathered such a wonderful plethora of information from our teachers, what they've been doing. Um, they've been doing some great art activities. We have wonderful organizations and we're just built relationship building to enhance all student growth. Um, I'm researching cross-curricular integration and testing out these lessons in, in classrooms and then connecting with community resources. So we have a great arts community. We have LOCA, the Laguna Art Museum, uh, Festival of Arts Foundation and the Festival of Arts and many other avenues to connect our students with great experiences and eager community members that would love to um, engage students. So as you saw in our study session, we did a STEAM art activity that was made for second grade students. And I think integration is the key with arts, uh, a whole BAPA program. The more we integrate it K through five and have a creative output at the end of a lesson or even some simple strategies, uh, teachers will notice the engagement levels rising and it's just scientifically proven that your visual association improves your schemata and you're able to retain that information and we need future innovators. So art is really the key to creating careers for our students and they can make their own career. So this is what we need. Um, this is a uh, video that, <laughs> not the greatest editor, but uh, this is a video that I um, made that shows and outlines some of the things that we have done in our program. And I can get it Yes, I can see that. <laughs> so sorry. There we go. All right. All right, so it should play now. Thank you so much. Okay. This is what we've done so far with our um, program. So there is sound on this mic. Oh. So this was a. Um, this, okay, no worries, I'll just explain. This is a uh, wonderful um, integrated unit we had with La Papa, Laguna Plain Air Painting Association. And what they did is um, created for all fourth grade students a plein air painting project. So this is the critique that students are engaging in at the Irvine Museum. And then we did a paint out um, with all fourth grade students in the district at different locations. And um, the canvases were provided by La Papa. And we had a, the principals were nice enough to fund paints and brushes, and we were able to bring all the students outdoors with easels that were donated um, to paint some landscape painting, which is iconic to our town, and it's the founding um, of the Festival of Arts. The La Papa Association is what made this town is plein air painters. So really a great project. Um, those are El Moro students, and they got to pick out their scene and <laughs> um, scope out where they wanted to paint. And they were very proud of their projects. As you can see, they all look different, and that's the key. They got to choose what they wanted to do. And then I hung them up at seven degrees for um, a small evening so that parents and uh, teachers and community members could see the paintings and get that experience. Um, it was really cool to walk around and hear all the kids' comments on what they had to say about their painting, and they were using art vocabulary. And then the Laguna Art Museum is just a fantastic organization. Um, we're encouraging more teachers. Some have already seized this opportunity and have been doing it. And more teachers are um, jumping on board once they've seen how wonderful this connection is. And the Laguna Art Museum will, <coughs> free of charge, have the students come in, do an art activity, kids get to take it home. It's a wonderful experience for them. And this is one of my, I think, the teacher's favorite 
uh, projects where they got to look at xylem rays, so another steam activity, um, the veining of trees, and where they get their nutrients, and they were able to create these really cool contour line drawings with paint pens, and then they remember that information. They were showing me their xylem rays, and uh, then we have, this is a clip from our steam field trip, and so that's what they were getting, they got to do, they got to see fish and invertebrates up close, read the story, and then create artwork from it. So it just, uh, these meaningful experiences just tie everything in together. And rather than doing all these small units, it's just something very simple that we can help our teachers to spread this knowledge to them and integrate a very small art activity at the end of the lesson um, that just integrates everything. And now we've gotten the Laguna Art Museum to bring all these programs on site so the teachers that can't come to the museum can come um, and get that experience. We're having a show there too this summer, so you're all invited. Um, we had some performing arts uh, integration as well. This is Jazz Reach. It's a program uh, provided and, and paid for through the Laguna Beach Life. And they came at El Moro, and uh, the fifth grade students were able to hear what music um, is made of, harmony, rhythm, and melody, and they were able to learn all about that and engage, and it was a really cool experience. So we hope to inc incorporate more performing arts avenues in the future year. So, yeah, so I think it's rare that they got to see such wonderful performances from professionals, which they're from New York. We had a fifth grade team also participate in hand painting a mural, and we've just now I've been trying to integrate art lessons. This is an art lesson we did. So my plan is just to keep this going. <laughs> and next year, um, hopefully, I have a schedule where I can come to each location on a regular basis and just keep this project and improve it and spread this to the performing arts even more, maybe even go through drama and performing arts and see how we can find avenues for that. So appreciate everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just think it's amazing what she's done in such a short amount of time and how really because of you reached out to the community as a whole. Um, it just kudos. Um, I, yeah, it's you've done far more than I could ever have drafted. Thank you. Let's not have our masters ever again. <laughs> Bridget's an extraordinary uh, instructional services team member. We're so pleased she's a part of our team and we get to share her with the high school. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining our team. Any public comment after this presentation? You've done more than I ever thought possible with just your one, you know, doing in one period. Amazing. So grateful for you and the community outreach and bringing art to the community. I appreciate two, two things particularly that you've done. I think we had some relationships a while back with local entities, particularly the Art Museum and LCAD, and they've kind of drifted away, and we really refresh those because I believe they are willing to do things, but they just haven't been a connection. They've kind of we lost it a bit. And then the other is the um, calendar that's put out. I really appreciate that, to have it all laid out when things are coming in to know so that we can go and participate in and see the students work. Thank you. Okay, our next information item is a report of supplementary materials. This is quite short, but it's just, uh, I wanted to share with you the last two pro um, supplementary programs were brought forth at the Curriculum Council and approved by the Curriculum Council. So the first is an intervention program, K-5, and it, it, um, intervention teachers were particularly pleased by the comprehension success and the, the ability of the program to provide prescriptive um, supports for students in reading comprehension and the Tennessee PQ with Michelle Martinez. <coughs> so she's going to use those first. Yes. Nice. And we're short. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any public comment on our questions for Alicia? Okay, then uh, we move to our next item is monthly financial update. Mr. Dixon. 
President Vickers. I only need a few minutes on each page to go with. So, there are, oh, yeah. 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 there are not a lot of changes on it. It does not reflect the big payment we got in April. This is at the end of March. Um, so, um, at that time, we, and we still are tracking as pretty much expected. Um, the one big change that came in April was that our property tax receipt was about 1% less than we were expecting. So, it's a little bit less than we thought, um, but uh, we are making those adjustments right now. So, you'll see that at the budget proposal in June with the estimated actuals and um, the revisions moving forward. I would like to point out on um, Page 83, you can see all the, the fund and the projected income balances. Um, general fund, is, again, is tracking as expected. The fund 11, fund 13, same. Uh, fund 17, which is our basic aid differential, is still a little over 16 million. And um, all the fund 40s for uh, the CIP and the FERC, which also count as reserved, are in place. With that, I would be happy to take any questions you have anyone else. Uh, I just had a quick question on page one of three. Uh, the occupational, physical, and speech therapy, and vision therapy, those are all out of district or not with our pushing at all. So we're on that page with the mm -hmm. speech is about um, seven up from the bottom. Last page and then. I would have to. 5885, 5886. Yeah. I'll have to look into that to be absolutely certain okay. if those are services. Uh, are the, the, sorry, not on the white page. The OT and PT would definitely oh, be outside the district right. because we don't employ those no. individuals. Under number right. 18. Okay, that's what, that's what right. I assume. I assume probably the vision and speech therapy are. So this so. is probably contracted services. Yeah. I'm, okay. Who's looking at it? Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Any public questions or comments on this item? Okay, thank you, Jim. Our next item, our beginning of our action items. Our first item tonight, number 19, approval to add the sports of lacrosse and wrestling to the Unity High School Athletic Office. Um, I'll have uh, uh, Dr. Neal uh, come and give a little brief update as to uh, what information he's put together and uh, what his recommendation is at this point. First, I, a running joke in our house when, when you were on a long day or something was going hard, we'd always say you have to test yourself every day. So appreciate you guys being here and testing yourselves today. <laughs> um, Victoria, do you have our slideshow? Did we have some slides on there? I didn't get any. It's in the. We only had three. It's in the. It's in there. Okay. Are those the charts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have the charts. Okay. So uh, basically, um, we uh, I laid out a startup cost. Mr. Dixon then uh, extrapolated out over five years. Is that correct, Mr. Dixon? Just identify ongoing versus the one time. Or versus the one time. So if, if you take a look um, and you have any questions about the one time startup, um, uh, feel free to ask. Um, lacrosse boys is a fairly, um, you know, to, to suit a player up, it's between $400 and $450. Um, I can tell you this being a deck in the last eight years, we never had a lacrosse player that did not have their own stuff. You know, our plan would be to assess and buy a baseline set of equipment if we had some kids. But uh, I met with the lacrosse vendor earlier this week, and like one of his things, I was asking him specifically about helmets. Football helmets have to re recondition yearly. Lacrosse helmets have a one-time sticker, and they're they're basically have a ten-year life. And I said, well, do you ever have the helmet going out of the ten-year life? He says, no. Every time a new helmet comes out that's more updated, the family goes out and buys it. Um, and that, that has been my practice. I mean, we did not at Beckman High School spend any money on kids outfitting. They all had their own stuff. Um, but again, when you look at $450, and I think we built it out on 25 kids, where, again, if we were guessing right now, we would probably buy 10 to 15 sets just in case, you know, someone came up and they didn't have it. But that is the actual worst-case scenario build-out number right there. 
the division is different for girls. Girls, and girls don't wear a helmet. They don't wear elbow pads. They don't wear shoulder pads. They have a set of eye guards and a stick. So that's. Like they don't the crap out of each other like boys do. And not, 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 my house. not as much. That's that old my house. <laughs> So it's it's interesting. Like if you go with a single uniform sport, uh, cross country, track, water polo, you know they wear one uniform. It's a hundred dollars a kid. Uh, you go into a two uniform sport like basketball where they have a home and away. It's two hundred dollars a kid and then you have your balls and that stuff an interesting one that i think draws a, a good example is baseball a you can go out and buy a baseball bat for fifty dollars uh our kids probably all have bats that cost between 200 and 400 dollars none of them asked the school to buy those for them we wouldn't buy those for them if we had to provide a bat we would provide the 50 dollars bat that fits the regs and is okay um so you know uh, to, to outfit a baseball player with a helmet, they probably have three sets of uniforms right now. The bat, a $125 glove, it's actually equally as expensive as lacrosse. But again, most of those expenses are ones we never incur because they end up being personal items. All of the lacrosse players have their own shoulder pads. It's not like football where you check them in and you check them out. Um, so again, if you look, there's your worst case build out scenario. Um, uh, but again, baseball is a working example. We're not you know, we're not spending that. We're, we're buying the uniform they wear. E even the batting helmet, which used to be in the dugout and everybody used the six helmets. Everybody has their own helmet now. They don't want to put someone else's helmet on. They had a life scare when they were in elementary school. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's gone away. So um, other things like they are what I, I call 20 point sports. Basically you get 20 point game, 20 games a season. So they're traveling the same as our other teams. Um, wrestling is a little more tournament heavy, like our lacrosse is. Um, you know, they have five dual matches and they have a lot of tournaments. Uh, lacrosse, I mean, wrestling is a lot like that. So, in terms of that piece, very similar to what our cross country teams do. So, very, very comparable to what we have in place. Boys lacrosse is a expensive sport when you look at the whole big picture. Wrestling, other than the startup of the wrestling mat, is a very inexpensive sport. Where they have a single singlet, and that's that's what they wear. Uh, headgear, usually, again, the kids all end up buying it themselves, and it's a $25, $30 piece of equipment, so it's not an expensive piece either. So, the, the five year equipment rotation is pretty much what we have right now. So they just again we, we've gone through a whole bunch this year one of the things that was was legit that our community came back to us with like cross country why are we paying for our kids to compete in cross country meets i didn't have a good answer um because they were their boosters were paying for that uh nobody goes three years without uniforms anymore so our boosters were buying uniforms for our team sometimes rather than us. So what we worked on is, is we worked on a build out budget to where our teams all get a budget now annually rather than uniforms every third year and a little bit of ASB money. So all of our teams now over a three year period from us um, get over double than what they used to get. And that was just a reworking of our budget and putting it in our coaches' hands to here are the things that your kids need and you can spend it on, anything on the kids, to where our boosters now are not funding things that are a part of the regular educational process. So, you know, our teams all now receive somewhere between $1,500 and five thousand dollars. Football is a big sport that's that's expensive, so it gets a little more water pole. Like we talked about, they have a single, they get a little less. But so everybody has an annual budget that these guys would fit right into that same annual budget. And again, it was just a reworking and a redistributing of our numbers. Um, Jeff gave me our athletic number, and we worked from there and uh, and built it out. Thanks for that. And how is this comparable to other sports like lacrosse? How is that dollar wise combined and comparable to? Again, once everything's in place, it's the same as our baseball program or yes. I mean, again, I, I haven't done that, but most of our teams are budgeted at about $3,000 and these would fit right in there. Now going into next year, um, because you got winter and spring, so the students will be signing up. I mean, you won't, when will you decide if these are actually going to work with, with students signing up to do it? 
Ms. Holtz is here, science teacher. You guys have, have read, seen her in the room before. She actually played college lacrosse, and she comes and sees me every week. Her plan is to run a couple clinics to see how many girls we get out. Um, we have a gentleman from last week who has an eighth grade son who he's gonna he would help us with staffing and that would be the plan before the school year ends get an idea of how many kids we have out and are interested wrestling because we don't have a mat yet that would have to wait till this summer um, but but basically with the student interest I mean how many girls come by and see you on a regular basis um, quite a few in my classes asking when the class is going to start. So, so we know we're going to have enough to field teams. Um, out of the shoot, we would schedule teams that aren't as good. We would probably play kind of a combined JV varsity. Uh, for example, a Sage Hill, we could play their varsity. Uh, at Beckman, where I came from, we would play their JV. So we would run a combined schedule that gave our kids the opportunity to get some experience and have some success. You know, we're not going to go schedule the very best right off the bat. And, and, uh, so can we do that with our with our? Kind so of thing. we have nobody in our league that plays, so oh, we would good. be paying Sweet. playing. We can do whatever we want. We'd be playing independent as a do it. Oh, okay. So that's for one more year, right? Mm -hmm. That's the league for next year. Yes. Yeah. So this is this, this is important that we get this done. Right. We we, <laughs> we, need to, we need to we need to have success right off the bat. And wrestling's the same way. You know, we would have to be very choosy in the things we would competed in to make sure and all of these success is what makes the kids enjoy themselves and get out and uh and again i've been fortunate to be a lot of places and walk these processes and uh i'm confident we can we can get it done it'll be you know it'll be we're going to jump in but it would be a smaller step you know we're not going to jump in and drown ourselves right off the bat. And after next year the other schools have teams? The Sunset League has some of them playing, and, and I'm, I'm talking about something where I hope we're not going to be. Okay. We're going to appeal so, that. If we okay. went into the Irvine League, they all they have all that. Them. Yes. So it's important to note that um, in order for us to run a, a boys lacrosse program, we'll have to be able to run a girls lacrosse program, mm -hmm. strictly because of Title IX issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the wrestling, because it's co-ed, um, is one of those um, opportunities that uh, isn't necessarily as incumbent upon um, uh, the timeline component. Um, we always will be looking, and that's and I've talked about uh, adding levels as needed to ensure that we have that equitable components of, of female and male sports and participation as well. And it's always something we'll be looking at. Um, but you know, if there is approval tonight to move forward, um, we're pretty sure that we can. Uh, Accomplish this for very few dollars. Um, that in fact we already, you know, in our athletic side and budgets, um, we have enough to cover an assistant coach and head coach in our current system. So there's really uh, no increase there. Uh, our fuel costs. Um, that's confident that we would be able to manage our field to come up with a system that works and to have a location for our team to wrestle. So, you know, as with all situations, storage will become a premium. Uh, storing maps, all the things that, you know, when we build high schools, we never think of. Uh, storing goals for lacrosse, all those different things. But um, all things I think uh, we can definitely accomplish. And I think our students and our parents and our community have, have expressed that interest um, to us, especially this year. I think, like I said, in the original one, I think we were pleasantly surprised with the, the girls' interest in lacrosse. We knew we had a lot of boys playing club. We didn't know we had a lot of girls interested, and that was a, a very eye-opening piece for us. Here's a question. How many people does it take to make up a lacrosse team? So the girls have how many on the field? It's 11 and oh, a goalie. So and, 12. and the boys are one less, 10 and a goalie. So a, a real real comfortable number is low 20s. You know, you can function with 15. 15. They all get a lot of playing time. That's and that's, boys. so girls, what would be a minimum number? For girls, I mean, you could really minimum do 14. We have very limited, limited subs, but it's okay. That's all right. Yeah, that's what it was with Polo for a while. Polo for a while, yes. It's really rich. Do any public comment on this item? Any more board comment or discussion? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank so, you. Start thank, you. thank you for all the You're welcome. We're excited.
City regarding a park improvement project above Top of the World, it's a small park. But um, they want to do some improvements that would happen to cross over our property line. Uh, our property line goes to the V ditch on the slope. It's all very unusable space. Um, however, because it does cross that line and they would want to maintain it because it would become part of usable park space, um, this would be granting them a landscape easement. Um, however, this is a two step process. So tonight we need to have a resolution passed with the intent that we are looking to do an easement, and next meeting we will actually come with the uh, easement agreement in public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Summer. Any public comment? Uh, any other board commission discussion? So it will oh. be the next meeting. Sorry, next meeting is public hearing. Yes. Are there some in favor? Aye. 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 Do we oppose? Next item, action item 22, award a contract for vacant replacements at various sites to Desk Contracting Services, Inc. in the amount of $317,713, which results in a total project cost of $434,565.15. I will take it. Uh, we had a roofing pro project scheduled for this summer. Um, we did receive three bids, however, also one came after the bid deadline, which is why it was non responsive. Um, we're doing this the same way we've been doing our roofing projects in the past, which is we buy the materials directly so we don't have to get the contract to mark up, and we bid the insulation and, and the actual minor materials that they buy. Um, Best contracting services uh, came in at the lowest responsive bid, and CI services is right behind them. And this was Pretty much what we expected the cost to come in at, and that's from top of, or, uh, sorry, Elmoral covered walkway and gutters, and Thurston uh, over the band room. So, and capture. Do we have a comment? Any discussion or questions? Over six. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Raise a vote. Uh, next is action item 23, award of contract for site work for three modular buildings and music building addition at Top of the World Elementary to R. Jensen Company, Inc. in the amount of $980,000. Very similar. We have three bidders. All of them were responsive this time. Uh, and this is the site work of replacing the portables that are currently out there with the permanent modular buildings. Um, this is just the site work. The modular buildings we had taken action on over a year ago, and they are basically already built. And um, we awarded this work. Uh, we issued a notice to proceed on June 1st so that we can try and get it done over summer break. I do have a card for comment on this item. Uh, I just wanted to remind the board of a few board meetings on the, these, the new construction. One on January 12th, 2016, where uh, Mr. Dixon addressed the board and, and stated this contract is specifically for the CLC portable replacements with permanent rooms and the music classroom. We go down a little bit later, and Mr. Lanzadol, um says, uh, the CLC classroom sorely needed a new place. They were well past their prime. And Ms. Brown said, question, is CLC 
going to maintain the extra classroom they use for math and that sort of thing? And Mr. Dixon said, yes, they're actually going to increase the amount of square footage they currently have. Because after our analysis of their educational space, they needed more, and they're going to have a full 960 square foot extra room. But in addition to that, they'll have the op their office and restrooms, so it's an additional, I believe, 540 square feet. It was all approved. Um, and then at the April 26, 2016 meeting um, that you referred to in your backup materials for this um, action item, CLC's, it, you, it states, CLC stakeholders, as well as Principal Conlin and Top of the World, were deeply involved in the planning for the Gen 7 buildings. Gen 7 buildings are the buildings, the prefab buildings that are being put on the site. I'm speaking to this because my husband was on that committee and spent a lot of time on it and a lot of last minute meetings. You know, David Katz, right? Um, and he is at home with our children who should be asleep. So I just wanted to remind the board of the construction and the purpose and what the kids have been told and my daughter stated so um, earlier. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Any motion, please? Any board question or discussion? Well, there, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, well, I, uh, I just wanted to ask, which I did before, so it's all out in the open. So if CLC doesn't continue, how will they continue to be used? No, uh, I think, you know, of course, the key for us is uh, space utilization in all of our school sites. Uh, so with our current situation uh, at um, Top of the World, we added the all-day, full-day kinder. Um, the science room will need to another location. Uh, there also is interest in special education to bring uh, our STC program. Uh, we have one classroom that we would like to bring over to Top of the World so that um, we have a little bit of equity from beyond both sites. Um, and there's some interest in, in doing that. Obviously, space is, is obviously the conversation that we um, are always somewhat tight and, and locked in. Uh, but we would look at spatialization across the district and programs that we have and determine what would be um, the, the option for them to go into this. So as we all are aware, all out spaces, et cetera, are all very um, needed for our, our teachers and our spaces that we, that we can find those points. So to speak directly to it, I couldn't tell you exactly what it would be yet, yeah, no, but okay. it would Thank it, it would maybe be in terms of like the site and, and the program that it's And then the well, I guess we're looking at whether we continue to continue CLC. Are they going to be in the building? As you do this analysis, they could be in any place of the country, or would they be in that building? Is it is that all part of the well, analysis? Uh, speak to the building itself. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the simple statement was. We're taking rid of those relocatables. CLC needed the space to go into, so that made sense. Um, but if, if the past is any indicator of, of alternative programs, um, you know, alternative program originally started out in uh, it's been in various locations. It's actually part of the initial discussion with the prefab twenty three. So um, who's out? And, uh, it's been housed there for quite a while, um, but it could very well you know, relocate to another campus if necessary. Or an interest or that there might be a space utilization. So, um, that being said, I think it would be uh, premature to have that specific discussion. But to your point, yes, uh, yeah, it's based on uh, space and building. Just add a little bit there. You don't have answers for it. I think the original building broke down. Right, or burned. The 
original bur building burns. The continuation school yeah. was damaged in the fire in 93 to the extent that it was not, um, it wasn't cost effective to, to repair it. And it was, it also had some issues with age. <laughs> so, because that was for them. Before it was our continuation school, I don't know what it was. <laughs> it's behind the baseball field. That's <laughs> so I think I don't know whether they would have moved. I mean, they moved. They moved before that happened. Okay. Any other discussion questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries one by vote. Is that? Let's say last night. So now it's time for um, our last section, which is board member requests of items for future agenda items, requests for information, or general comments. Changing color in there and the potential of the water alternate, right? And, uh, and it's, it's really interesting. They're, they're piloting. They took feedback from ACE and NC, the teachers and parents, and administration, right? And they just had a pilot program. So they're also looking at teachers and parents out there to mirror what they're trying to see and what they're trying to see. Sorry, so I wanted to share it because I thought it was, yeah, it was a neat way to collaboration or one Yes, um, went to the Accelerating Language Learner Success uh, event um, at the Marconi Automotive. It was quite the place. I mean, that was, they were honoring Jerry Kennedy, and it was lovely. Um, it was actually a very nice event. And, you know, I think she appreciated it. Quite a few folks showed up, so that was good. Um, I also accidentally, lovely, wandered into the peer court at um, Thurston. Mm -hmm. I was taking roasted beets to go ahead. But, but I, I was going across the field and Michelle was standing out there and she's, are you coming to Pier Court? And I was like, well, no, but you want me to? And she said, well, you know, if you get a chance, I went in there, oh my gosh, it, it was probably one of the most amazing things I have seen, um, primarily because our kids are so well-spoken. The real, you know, because it's, it's crime, it's right? It's real. it's real. But the real crime is the fact that the kids that were on trial haven't had even half the opportunities that our kids have. The, the, the vocabulary, the ability to pose questions, um, it, it was, it was mind-boggling and really, really, really moving to see and to realize that the, the, the crime is the education. It's not the kid. And and it was, anyway, I, if, if when they do it again, um, you know, I, I, I would ask Michelle, because I it was literally serendipitous that I wandered in, and I, to, just so, other, and you just stand in the back, you know, like, you know, it's it was it was incredible. Also, we just want to thank publicly Cindy and um, Cindy Kimmel and, and Chris Costa for the work they do. I think it is so vital and so important for our kids. So. Just want that out there, and then um, I would ask you, Jason, to um, I think Mr. Hills had some inaccurate information in his comments um, about the dollars we spent moving money Chris and Chris. that sort. Of, yeah, if you could just um, correct that, I would be really appreciative. Thank you. Um, I I was moved and just grateful for the staff that we have and our community people that are stepping up to help our students. Um, I also went to the um, principal survey thing to keep keep Jason and Lisa company. <laughs> people that know there are a few people. So but they brought up what you brought up, Carol. That was one of their items okay. was I mean absences absences of kids. Okay, that's right. Oh. 
appreciate hearing about the awards at El Molocot for their um, resources for the kitchen. That was um, nice, really nice for them. I know they work hard. And some of our staff there work with the boys and girls club in the summer. So they're very they're diligent. I stopped in the uh, community wellness resource fair for the people coming because I've been I was going to go anyway, but I went to the BRAC meeting and Marissa was quite content that we would come. And it was she they put a lot of work into that. They had a lot of a lot of displays there, a lot of information. It was really, really nice for the parents because there was a, a lot there are a lot of resources, but as a parent it's not necessarily easy to find out what those are. So we bring it here and it and as um, there is a lot of Spanish speakers that could really get the information to the parents that need to get out. Um, the, I had already shared with Jason out of the DLAC meeting, parents were really concerned with our residency verification, and Yadi, Yadi didn't ask me to bring that, that forward, but she has worked really hard to convince them. They really feel that it targets them, mm -hmm. and um, so she's she's working really hard to, and I, kept, and I told her, no, it's everyone, it's everyone in the district. But because it's a new program, and yeah. some, of them, some of them have been here for a long time, but there's just such a such a, a ten, an emotional aspect of that right now in our current well, political climate now. that boy, that discussion got really lively, and uh, she was quickly translating a lot for me since I don't, especially when they speak fast when they're really passionate. But it would, and then they then when I I left because I was going down to see the arts, the, the banners down at the art. Uh, gallery downtown, they were getting ready to do a presentation for the parents on the dashboard. <laughs> well, the audio and Marissa were saying, okay, here we go. <laughs> here, I said, well, it's pretty pretty complicated. You know, they were going to take ta tackle that for those parents. Um, I also stopped in at when the, um, is it Ben, ben and Edie, is that Mrs. Sandra's last name? Ben and Tini. Ben, ben and Tini. Ben and Tini. And it was the one that did, and they had a language uh, speech therapist speaking to them. She was so high energy, but I really liked it because she was really addressing how important it is to pick up the book, pick up the book and read to your kids. That she said, you know, that don't just give them the tablet. And she was really explaining to the uh, parents that were there of the if you give your child a tablet and they read the book with that, that you don't have any chance to interact with them. And know what they're thinking, and that that way that they learn communication and increase their vocabulary is to be that interaction about the story. And she was you know, that you don't just read the story. It was great. It was really a really great presentation. And Sandra also told me how many were to win it, and there's this curious you know, name going around. So our grant lets us do that thing for primarily preschool parents, and they're really really great programs. So she's and she works really hard at that. Um, the other, one other thing is, um, when I see these, the people that are retiring tonight, or, you know, the last few years, these are like really leaving the families. They live in, they were able to live in this community. They raised their kids here. Their kids went through school. So there's so much interconnection, which is one of the reasons that I have always been so supportive of allowing our staff to bring their kids to school. I just think that that, it, it, it's harder, I think, when they don't actually live in town. But to commit but to do that, to bring your children here and have them be involved in our community, then gives you that kind of tie-in and that familiarity to that mm -hmm. for the needs, right? And it just drives that point home. I just think it's, I think it's invaluable. So, and then the other, you come on the student paper, it's really great. And I was picky and asked Jason that question to make sure that I thought that was really, um, that those students really put themselves out there, that knowing that they did uh, have a lot of counseling and it's, Contact with the school psychologist before they took that step. That what it what Jason pointed out to me is that then it's that really attempt to start to do more of the removal of stigma to really get out there and so that they it's are really great. It's great, but it also really helps everybody else mm -hmm. uh, so that we move away from that point of view. And start conversations. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. that's exactly. It. And I think our students, you know, are probably more ready to that more that than students in some of the other districts because of the work we've been doing for years with character counselors, it's challenging and it's, but it's, it's not for the rest. They're very great. Thank you. Our next meeting, it will be Tuesday, June 13th, here in the boardroom at 6 p.m.